let's extend nearest neighbors to k nearest neighbors, which is a really, really easy and simple extension. The point is here is that instead of looking at your nearest neighbor, you get a community to decide. We're going to use the k closest training data points rather than just the closest one to make a vote and decide what is the class of that particular point. Right, and usually, obviously, we would set k to some odd number so that we don't have voting ties, right? If you set k nearest neighbors to two, then the two nearest neighbors could disagree and then you'd be at a standstill about how to resolve it. So we'll usually set k to some type of odd number to resolve that. So now that we've moved to a k nearest neighbors, we need to know how to choose k. So, when we have a small number of nearest neighbors, actually we get a fairly complex surface. So here we have the single nearest neighbor we introduced in the pre-lecture work. You can see what it's doing is it's just trying to do that Voronoi tessellation that we saw earlier. So for example, look really closely at this green dot over here or this blue dot over here. You can see it's basically uh, defining a polygon that's a Voronoi tessellation um, distance from the other points from the other classes, okay? So uh, to try to parameterize or uh, discuss exactly how to encode the surface is really, really difficult. And so when we move to larger and larger K, we get a more smooth type of surface, uh, which looks a little bit more regular. So here we have nine nearest neighbors. Uh, sorry, I didn't circle that very well, but you can see what's happening is the, the curve looks a bit smoother so far over here, for example, it's gotten a lot smoother than the comparative one on this side, right? Which has a lot of uh, nooks and crannies here. Um, and that's gonna continue when we use more and more of the data set uh, to define the nearest neighbors, then we're gonna get smoother and smoother surfaces here. So you can see uh, with the exception of a little patch of outliers over here and here, basically it's uh, devolved into three specific patches, which are uh, our three classes here. So, um, of course, if we move to even higher number of nearest neighbors, it's going to regress to just uh, calling everything the majority class, right? If we use the entire data set and say, what's the majority of all the points? It's just going to pick the, the class that's most frequent and call every point that way. Um, so, our question to you is to think about which of these um, surfaces, you know, going from smaller K to larger K is going to work better to generalize to a new data set. So a quick question to you, what value of K maximizes the performance on the training data? Okay, here I'm particularly asking about the training data, not the test data. So when you train a K nearest neighbor algorithm, right, there's no time involved, right? We can think of it as order zero or one time. So hopefully you answered k equals one, right? In fact, in the pre-class notebook, you should have seen that when you train the nearest neighbor algorithm, that you get a training performance of one. That's not surprising, right? Because you're testing on the same point that is in your data set, and trivially, each point is going to be its own nearest neighbor, and it'll be classified to correctly to its own label, right? But our question is more about, will it generalize? So in particular, when you look at these points over here, like this green point and this blue point here, we are not that sure that those points are gonna be actually good measurements. It could be that there's an error in the measurement, could be that they're outliers. All of these reasons are good reasons that we think probably this decision surface that has all these nooks and crannies, like the ones over here, is probably not an actual uh, fair representation of the data. Right here is sort of artificial because we've only taken two specific dimensions of the iris data set to characterize um, this plot. So then by default, we'll try to use a larger K to try to smooth over the bumps so that we can get a more generalizable model, right? Because we think our test data might not exactly line up with the training data. Okay, let's talk about distance metrics. We said earlier when we were talking about nearest neighbor that the distance metrics matters a lot. 
And if we don't have a really good idea of distance metrics, we'll often use Euclidean distance as a first try. And that's also known as the L2 distance measure or uh, L2 norm, where we are taking a, a sample data point uh, from our training data set, let's say point to I here, and we're comparing it with the distance, uh, we're calculating the distance between that point and a, 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 a test point. So it's just basically, um, you know, Euclidean distance, which is just the square difference of each of the dimensions, then taking the square root. Okay, but actually, of course, we don't have to use that distance metric. We can define any distance metric as long as it follows a distance metric type of definition, which has the properties of non-negativity, symmetry, so it doesn't matter which point uh, you're measuring from, uh, to, and the triangle inequality that your points are uh, not going to be uh, farther, they have a transitive relationship. So defining your distance metric to fit your data semantics is uh, very important. Uh, it can be a make or break uh, part of the algorithm for using the nearest neighbors. And I'd like to show you why that's the case uh, through several different examples. So in particular, let's look at this case that we learned before. This is the credit approval problem that we covered in the first lecture. All right, so do you think L2 distance metric is going to be a good metric for this particular problem? And the answer is a definite <laughs> wrong. Okay, and this is because we have feature values here that are really, really distinct from each other. So we have age, gender, salary, debt. Okay, let's just take a look at the first two, age and gender, right? When we compute an L2 distance metric, that's basically saying that age and gender can be mixed together in some way to form a difference value. Even if we were to make male and female into a numeric features, which we could calculate distances over, it's not really clear how age and gender factor together to make a distance measure to compare. But for all of these reasons, when you have incomparable categories in your feature definition, probably L2 distance metric is not going to work out for you. Okay, so this is definitely no. Probably we'd want something like L1, uh, which we'll talk about later, which is basically taking each of these uh, feature inputs and then calculating a difference for each one and then aggregating all of them together rather than mix and match different parts of the features to con concatenate or create a distance metric. So here's another case of why KNN distance metrics are really difficult to deal with. Let's say we have an image classifier, just like the one that we showed you in the pre-assignment notebook, where we're using L1 distance, basically competing, let's say, uh, the difference between this pixel up in the upper left and the, the pixel value here, here, and here, right? So we have four different pictures. We're trying to pick each one. So that might be okay for some pixels, but for most of the cases, this isn't a very useful metric because uh, all three of these uh, modified pictures have the same L1 distance compared to the one on the original. And you can see this is really strange, right? Um, you can see where the differences are. So for example, in this particular image uh, over here, the boxed image, we've only made one difference, which is to put uh, these black boxes over the eyes and mouth. And that's causing a difference between the original and this one. Here on the second image, we've just shifted the picture a little bit. You can see that the top part here has been shifted downward a couple uh, rows. So basically the entire image over here has been shifted downwards. So all the pixels have been moved. And uh, the same amount of difference is present in all those pixels as compared to the three boxes in the box one. And here, and the last one is basically the same idea as the shifted one. We've just tinted every single pixel a little bit, so that it's only a, a tinted difference from the original. And all three of these have the same distance value for L1 distance. But for us as a, a human, when we recognize these, we probably can't tell the difference between the shifted and the original unless we're looking closely at it. And definitely we'd say the tinted and the shifted are closer to the original than the boxed. So another thing about KNN is it's important to do scaling and normalizations for that. So let's look at the wine quality data set that we saw in the in-class session. 
Here we're plotting two particular attributes against each other, uh, which is the first two dimensions of fixed acidity, which ranges from 4 to 12 here, and volatile acidity, which seems to range from 0 to up to around 30. Okay, so this is the plot of all of the white wines in the wine quality data set, and those are unnormalized values. So this should be a 5, actually, not a minus 5, so uh, try to disregard that. In any case, let's think about this. If the fixed acidity ranges between five and nine, so a range of four, and volatile acidity ranges between zero and, and up to 15 for the normal mode of that, what do you think is going to happen when we're using something like Euclidean distance? That's exactly right. One of these scales, for example, the fixed acidity is going to be much more important because the data points are more closely arrayed on this issue, right? So the points that are farther away here, um, they're, they're going to be standing no chance to, to come close to the, to the mean, right, for the other points. So then it's actually really, really important to scale those values and to normalize them. So what we did is we just uh, applied normalization, uh, which gives us all the points um, to have a mean of zero. Okay, so the volatile acidity here is uh, zero. Okay, so that's the center of the data set. And same for the fixed acidity here. So you're going to give everything a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we're normalizing all the data, remapping the values to that uh, particular space. We should, here we've plotted both the uh, original unnormalized and the normalized forms, which you can see in your post notebook. We put them on the same uh, plot, and you can see where the values are heading towards. So this is going to put both the fixed acidity and the volatile acidity on the same scale, which is going to help the nearest neighbor algorithm uh, not make a distinction about which one is important, but just based on the scales of the data originally. Okay, so in summary, let's talk about KNN again. So KNN is a really simple but very powerful extension to the nearest neighbor model, which just says that let's take a vote between the K nearest neighbors. Right, And we saw that both in nearest neighbors and its extension in k-nearest neighbors, the distance metric is really, really important. And we can select the k in such a way to try to predict, a, uh, create a smooth model. Both of these uh, choices are called hyperparameters because they inform the learning algorithm about how to tune the individual parts of the learning space later. And what we need to do is set the hyperparameters, most importantly, wherever you can, uh, by using any prior knowledge of the data. So as we saw on the last slide on the wine quality data set, uh, we could normalize all the values to um, uh, have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But if we know a priori that there are certain parts of um, the scales or the features that are more important than each other, then we can change the way k-nearest neighbor works by either not normalizing or normalizing differently or choosing a more appropriate distance measure. Okay? Um, we are also going to need to reserve part of the data set for training to tune the hyperparameter. So if we're not sure exactly how much to choose, we can say, for example, we want to choose a K that's going to generalize well. We're going to cut the data set. Uh, let's say we have a training data set here. We're going to cut it into a part which we're going to save for training, the normal training, okay, and a part that we're going to call validation. We'll talk about that later. Basically, we can test on the validation set and then see whether the K choice that we did for training works well on the validation. And if we, it seems to work well, we'll hold that number k for the testing data later. So we have to do this and we'll run the test uh, on the, the selection of the distance metric and the k later on the test set. Definitely don't use the test set to tune these parameters because then when you actually apply it to the new real unseen data, you'll be in trouble because you're uh, having to tune the parameters basically only on the training data.